If I could get everyone's attention, please feel free to go back for seconds. I see some of our crowd are doing so. But I do want to get us started because we believe the last vote is underway, and so the senators will be joining us in a few minutes. And I am delighted to see so many of our friends and so many busy people here today, because believe me, uh, these Senate aerospace luncheons have turned out to be a real hit, both with staff up here, our own members, and certainly with the media. And I'm delighted to see a number of our print media reporters here today as well. Big thanks, though, of course, to the co-chairs of the Senate caucus, Senator Patty Murray from Washington State and Senator Saxby Chambliss from Georgia. We very much appreciate the kind of leadership that they are showing on issues that are so critical to aerospace and to our industry right now. I'm also delighted to tell you that I want to welcome a number in the leadership of several unions that are here today. We had a great event a week ago over at the Press Club uh, where Tom Buffenbarger joined Tom Captain, who I'll introduce in a minute, and myself, uh, to talk about the impact of the aerospace and defense industry. Uh, Tom, of course, is the head of the International Association of Machinists, uh, and we also have today, joining beside the machinist, uh, we've got the United Steel Workers, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and the AFL-CIO. Now, I also want to recognize, of course, here at the head table, our keynote speaker for today, Bob Stevens. Bob, of course, is the chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin Corporation, and he's a former chairman of the Aerospace Industries Association as well. Currently serves on our executive committee. I think most importantly, I can tell you, he is a voice of authority throughout our industry and through our economy. One other point of distinction I would also make, particularly in light of some of our guests today, I just learned that Bob is a card-carrying union member of the Fraternal Association of Steel Haulers. So, for our union colleagues, you're in good company. I also want to introduce Tom Captain. Tom is Vice Chairman and U.S. Aerospace and Defense Leader at Deloitte. Tom is the primary author of a new study that AIA commissioned as a part of our second to none campaign. The study, The Aerospace and Defense Industry in the US, a Financial and Economic Impact Study, details state by state aerospace and defense employment, revenues, taxes paid, and much more. So those of you who are here representing members, both Senate and House, I certainly want to call it to your attention because it gives you the detailed background on our involvement in your state. Page after page, the study lays out the bottom line impact of an industry that is second to none. And to steal a line from Tom, it's one of my favorite lines now, Tom, he explains that aerospace and defense is an industry that punches above its weight. What we have, of course, is not just impressive statistics behind us. It's also groundbreaking technology. It's how we knit the world together in the air and through the internet and how we provide our troops the very best technology to keep them safe and to protect our industry and our interests as a country. If you have any questions about the study, Tom's available after the lunch and I know he'd be happy to talk with you about it. We also have it on the table outside. One final thing I'd like to call your attention to and that is our clock. Now, the clock over here was in Times Square just yesterday above the crowds. You might ask why. It refers to the number of days before sequestration takes effect, 293 to be precise. If a remedy to sequestration called for by the Budget Control Act is not in place by January 2, 2013, another half trillion dollars will be cut from our budget. This is on top of the 487 billion reduction that DOD is already absorbing over the next decade. The impact? Pick your poison. Devastating, disastrous, catastrophic. That's what our defense leaders at DOD are telling us will be the impact. This is something that is a very serious threat to our national security. 
But NASA and FAA are going to be impacted as well. AIA estimates that the impact on the next generation air transportation system, next gen, could be cut by as much as 50 to 30 percent. But that's a big hit when you're talking about the development of a program that is going to provide satellite guidance and an entirely new air traffic control system for our country. And when we think about NASA, our reliance on the Russians at $60 million a pop to travel to and from the International Space Station, that just got a lot longer. We'll be hitching a ride for a long time to come unless we can do something about these cuts. An analysis by Dr. Stephen Fuller from George Mason University last fall laid out in very stark terms what's at risk from the standpoint of our economy. According to his analysis, sequestration will put more than one million jobs at risk, result in $60 billion in lost wages and salaries, add 0.6 to the nation's unemployment, and slow the growth of GDP by 25%. Those are big numbers, and they're ones that I really would tell you we all need to take seriously and come up here and talk with our representatives about how to avoid what will be a tremendous hit. So I'd encourage you to take one of our lapel pins. You may be able to see mine. I'm sporting it here today. Uh, and use it as a continuing reminder of the number of days left till sequestration and what we all need to accomplish before then together. Dr. Fuller's report, as well as the Deloitte study, and a report on the Defense Industrial Base Task Force which summarizes the defense capabilities at risk as defense spending declines. They're all available out here today. The task force is something that many of you in this room contributed to, but others may not be familiar with. Uh, and that was a group of representatives from industry who came together under the banner of AIA, NDIA, and the Professional Services Council to pull together a report on the capabilities that were going to be undercut at risk lost if sequestration goes into effect. Proud to say we delivered that report to Secretary Panetta at the end of November. He came together with us in January, and he was very strong in reinforcing the fact that it had been a very helpful thing in the last days of the budget discussion, in his discussions on the Hill, and he thanked us for our work and help. And we very much, believe me, valued that meeting with him. So I would simply say that these are all elements of what we're undertaking to drive home the risks that we are running at this point with the debates on the deficit and the debt. It's not that we don't take very seriously our country's financial problems. We, as an industry, have already stepped up when it comes to addressing the needed reductions in terms of the deficit and trying to bring the federal budget down. Uh, I think we're willing to be very good and responsible citizens as the Congress debates the various ways to address sequestration. And at the same time, we believe very strongly that it's something that we all have to pull together to find a solution and find a solution before the election. I know that there are many scenarios out there that say, well, Let's wait till the lame duck and somehow we'll solve everything in the lame duck. I don't know about you all, but I've counted the number of days in the lame duck. And boy, to accomplish everything that some folks are hoping uh, would be an absolute impossibility just in terms of physics and time. So we do need to address it now, not only because of that issue, but also because before the election, both OMB, the departments, and our industry are going to have to start to act on the probability, the possibility that sequestration will be in effect. We're already undertaking layoffs as an industry. We have to. We have to be solid citizens when it comes to the investments of shareholders in these industries. And we have to be, at this point, prepared. But being prepared means that we're going to be taking action a lot sooner than that January 2nd deadline. So I simply ask all of you to work with us on this. Let's take this seriously together and see what we can do. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a breather because I think, ah, 
Senator, we're delighted you're here. I did not see you come in. At this point, I'd like to turn the podium over to our co-chair of the Senate Aerospace Caucus, Senator Saxby Chambliss of Georgia. Senator, welcome. Good to see you. Well, thanks very much, man, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I think the size of this group is a good indication of how serious, number one, our issue of uh, the defense industry is in our country today, and uh, certainly, Van's comments are right on target, uh, as Leon Panetta said in, <clears throat> in his testimony before the Armed Services Committee recently. They are not planning on sequestration, but they're going to have to be prepared for it, and we know that, and she's dead on that they're going to have to start planning well in advance of any lame duck, and anybody that thinks that we can wait till the lame duck to address this issue, you're kidding yourself. And there is no more serious issue from a national security standpoint, in my opinion, right now than that issue. We're, uh, uh, as usually happens, unfortunately, when you schedule something at a time when you know there will not be a vote, uh, we're in the middle of a vote and Patty and I are sort of shuffling back and forth. Uh, she's gonna come, I think, after me now. And I'm gonna make some quick comments and then uh, have to get back over for, uh, for the final passage vote. But it is, um, it's a privilege always for me to be here and to be associated with Patty and, and uh, serving on this caucus as co-chairs. Uh, we have a lot of fun with it because we're both very defense oriented and we know that we represent the best people in the world and I get to work with folks like my good friend Bob Stevens who you're gonna hear from here shortly and um, I am just uh, very thankful to have the opportunity to share time with her, and she does just such a great job of leading us. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty clear that the aerospace and defense industry is obviously vital to the United States economy, as well as to our national security. The industry represents $324 billion in annual revenues and over one million direct jobs and $89.6 billion in exports, including a $42 billion trade surplus. Now, for a guy like me that represents a state that has the port of Savannah, having that trade surplus is a very key ingredient to the economy of my state and to the entire Southeast. As we in Congress, as well as those in the industries like Bob Stevens can attest, the United States capabilities in terms of airspace and defense research, development, production, and performance are the envy of every other country in the world. And that is why other countries so often seek to buy the products that are made by each and every one of you. In situations where it does not harm or threaten our national security, we need to make those purchases by other countries easier and more efficient and I hope that we can take steps to do that as former Secretary Gates and others have encouraged us to do. In terms of working with the Department of Defense, as I have often said, we need to see the industry as a partner and not as an adversary. And we need to realize that a robust, profitable aerospace and defense industry is in our national interest and certainly not in opposition to it. At the same time, we need to press to get as much value as possible out of every dollar we spend on defense. And there's never been a time in the history of our country that we need to think more in those terms than at the present time. And that's why I strongly support laws like the Weapons System Acquisition Reform Act of 2009 and other steps Congress has taken to make purchasing weapon systems more efficient as well as more affordable. And let me close by briefly addressing an issue that came up during the consideration of the National Defense Authorization Bill last year, an issue that is very near and dear to my heart and an issue that I know is of critical importance to just about everybody in this room, and that's the issue of depots and the DOD logistics and sustainment process. I know that many of the companies represented in this room have a stake in that issue, and I appreciate that and appreciate the role that you play. I've never been one to discourage competition or to encourage government to take on responsibilities that are more appropriate for the private sector. 
And in this area of depots, logistics, and sustainment, I don't believe that public depots need or deserve more than their fairly competed for fair share of the workload. Now, that being said, I do believe this. It is in the interest of both our national security and the American taxpayer that the government retain the capability to perform key workload and retain enough capacity to perform substantial amounts of that workload. Because if the government does not, there is a chance that we may not have the capacity when we need it, and also a strong likelihood that the taxpayer will pay more for that workload than they should. These are the principles that govern my thinking, and I hope there are principles on which we can all agree. Bob Stevens knows as much as anyone that in the coming years, we're gonna be buying a lot fewer platforms and sustaining a lot more older ones. And for that reason, this area of logistics and sustainment is going to grow in importance. I hope we can work together as partners to get the structures, processes, and policies in place to do that and in an efficient and affordable way that is organized around the most important factors, which are the national security of the United States, as well as the readiness of every branch of our armed forces. Now, I was prepared to call on, but well, Patty's here, so I can call on Patty instead of you, Bob. Uh, my dear friend Patty Murray, who as I said earlier, has been such a champion in this industry, and she has uh, been just terrific to work with, and we have a common goal of just making sure that this industry remains strong and viable from a policy standpoint. We're gonna do everything we can to continue down that road to make sure that that's exactly what happens. Patty is, um, uh, has been obviously a leader in this industry since before I got to the United States Senate. And indeed, it's a pleasure to work with her and I give you my good friend, Senator Patty Murray. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Chambliss. He and I are trading spots because we're voting on the floor, so we're <laughs> moving back and forth here. Senator Chambliss, thank you for your tremendous partnership and really appreciate all you're doing. And uh, I want to join in welcoming all of you here to our Aerospace Caucus Luncheon. I, too, really appreciate Mr. Stevens being here uh, and to have the ability to talk about the state of the aerospace and defense industries and the future of our global opportunities for Eurosp Air U.S. aerospace companies. Um, the topic of our lunch today is the state of the aerospace and defense industries in 2012 and beyond. As all of you know, for over 100 years now, we have led the world when it comes to aerospace. In fact, Bob Stevens and Lockheed Martin are really symbols of that heritage. Uh, this year, Lockheed Martin is celebrating a century since Alan and Malcolm Lockheed started the Alco Hydro Aeroplane Company, and Glenn Martin incorporated his company in Los Angeles with some of the most famous names in aerospace, like Douglas, McDonald, and Vought. And from the P-38 to the Predator, American aerospace companies have helped make our military the strongest in the world. Few industries have contributed to the economy over the last 100 years as much as our aerospace industry, and few industries have been as critical to our economic and military strength. But if we want to continue that for the next 100 years, we're going to have to work at it. We're going to need to make sure the industry remains the uh, maintains the dynamism to compete through the changing economic and business conditions the innovative ideas to advance technological development and improve products, and the access to capital that is necessary to compete on the international stage. This will involve preparing the next generation of aerospace thinkers, line workers, scientists, and engineers. It means our companies need to work with local colleges, workforce investment boards, and the local com community to make sure that there is a pipeline filled with the skilled and trained workers that our businesses need. And it means that the federal government needs to invest in education and skills training so students and workers get the support they need to succeed. We have a lot of work to do. And I appreciate all of you coming together to really focus on this on the future in this critical industry. 
Today I just want to talk quickly about two specific areas that I'm very focused on. First is helping our nation's heroes get back on the job, which is a long-term project um, that you all can be part of, and the Export-Import Bank, which I believe is needed to re be reauthorized as soon as possible. Uh, I chair the Senate Veterans Committee, and I take every opportunity that I have before a business audience of any kind to talk about the fact that despite the fact that our veterans have the leadership ability and the discipline and the technical skills to not only find work but to excel in the workforce of the 21st century, too many of them are struggling in this economy. And I don't think it has to be this way. I'm very committed to finding a solution to this problem and I'm here today to ask you to help. I was very proud that the President signed my legislation into law last year, the Vow to Hire Heroes Law Act, and we have started to take some real concrete steps forward. But it is only the first step. The next step is really building a partnership with businesses across the country to hire our nation's heroes. Companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin and many others are stepping up to the plate, <coughs> but every one of us has to work to tackle this problem. Everywhere I go, I give audiences a five-step process that they can take to help make sure that we hire our veterans, and I want to share that with you. First of all, I am asking companies to educate their human resources team about the benefits of hiring our veterans and how the skills that they have learned in the military really translate into what your company does. Secondly, I hope that all of you are working to provide job training and resources for our transitioning members, uh, service members as they come into the workforce. Third, every company should work very hard to publicize your job openings with our veteran service organizations at local military bases that, that can help connect our veterans and to work with our local one-stop career centers. Fourth, I urge you to develop an internal veterans group to mentor recently discharged veterans. Every veteran I talk to says it makes a difference to them at work if there's another veteran they know who can help them through the rough spots. And finally, companies should do what they can do to reach out to local community colleges and universities to help develop a pipeline of veterans using the GI benefit bill, bill benefits today to gain employment in their particular area. So if every company, large and small, could focus on those five steps, we will take a huge step towards making sure that our nation's heroes have a job when they come home. I know Lockheed is working really hard to re recruit veterans and make them feel welcome. In 2011, 38% of their external hires were veterans, and I want to thank them for that. Uh, every company t can take on this challenge, and I give it to you today. Uh, finally, I would just want to say that as we did talk about the global opportunities for U.S. aerospace companies, we have to talk about the future of the XM Bank, which, as you know, provides export financing for many of our aerospace companies. Every time the XM Bank supports a U.S. aerospace over sale overseas, it also supports thousands of small, medium, and large suppliers whose parts contribute to the final product. So I feel very strongly that we have got to reauthorize uh, the bipartisan legislation uh, on XM so that we can get this policy in place. Uh, my colleague, Senator Maria Cantwell, is authoring, authoring the amendment. We should be doing it in the next few days. Please bring it up with all of your local representatives because it is so important. Passing it will mean a short-term victory for our experters Sporters, but it will also tell our trading partners that the United States is a stable place to do business. So those are just a few of my thoughts today. I know you have a very important speaker. I want to turn it over to him. And I want to thank my uh, co-chair, Senator Chambliss, again. What you're doing will make a difference in the lives of Americans across the country. And I really appreciate your participating in, with this. With this, that, I'm going to turn it over to Marion, who's doing a great job. Really appreciate all of your work. And I'm going to have to race back to the floor so I don't miss final passage of the transportation bill. So thank you. Thank you. We definitely need to see those votes on that bill. Now, I simply want to very quickly introduce our main speaker today. Uh, Bob Stevens. Bob, of course, as I said earlier, is the current chair and CEO of Lockheed Martin Corporation. I know many of you know that he is also a former Marine, was enlisted in the Marine some years ago, and in between then and now, 
has had a number of leadership positions in our industry, including CFO within Lockheed. He's also done a great deal of public service over the course of his career. Most recently, he was appointed by President Obama as a member of the Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations. So we also appreciate those aspects of his contributions. Bob. Thank you, Mary, and good afternoon, everybody. It's very good to be with you, and I'm very glad you're all here with us today. First, I want to add my voice to Marion and so many others in thanking Senator Chambliss and Senator Murray for their leadership on aerospace and defense issues. You've seen evidence in their commentary today as to why their sustained leadership is so imperative in assuring that our nation has a solid program for national security and that we have a high level of vitality for the industry that supports that security. And we are very grateful for their leadership particularly noting that that leadership is occurring against the backdrop of an increasing set of demands. I want to thank also the members of the Senate Aerospace Caucus and particularly the members of their professional staff who are so actively engaged on a daily basis on the, interest, uh, the issues that are of interest to our industry. We appreciate their professionalism and their engagement. As Senator Murray highlighted, the industry has been a foundational source for driving technological leadership in America with more than a century of con contributions. It is not an exaggeration to say that our founding namesakes, Allen and Malcolm Lockheed and Glenn L. Martin, 100 years ago on this very day, were working on their first series of airplanes. They were laying the foundation for the airplane businesses that they started. And they, along with a handful of others, started the aerospace industry in America. I am very confident if they and those founding pioneers were with us today, they would be very proud of what they see and probably be a little astonished. But they would certainly share four basic observations about our industry today. First, as Senator Chandler alluded to, we're a critical contributor to the economic engine of America, generating $324 billion in revenue across our industry from businesses both large and small, contributing 2.3% to our country's gross domestic product, driving $89.6 billion in exports with a healthy $42 billion trade surplus, which is consistently more than any other sector of our economy, and generating $38 billion in wage and income tax revenues to federal, state, and local governments. We are a substantial source of economic power for our nation. Second, we are a wellspring of innovation and creativity and technological advancement. There's not a day in the lives of anybody in this room or any members of our families or anyone in this country that is not directly influenced by the work that we do, the way we travel, the way we communicate, the way we explore, the way we understand our universe and relate to our world. Many of the technologies that we've pioneered have become so ubiquitous that they've become invisible in daily life. But think of a world today without the unprecedented safety we enjoy in civil aviation and in our air traffic management system, the precision with which we are able to forecast weather and other atmospheric phenomena, the connectivity and content available through advanced information technology and networking capabilities, and the convenience and the comfort afforded by GPS and precision geolocation tools. Our work adds productivity and value and quality to the lives of every citizen every day. Today there's much discussion and a fair measure of apprehension about the future of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in America. We are that future. We're the incubator. We're the proving ground. We're where discovery lives and creativity flourishes. And our work inspires millions of young people every day. The very best way to avoid a debilitating shortage of scientists and engineers in America is to invest in the work that they do. Third, we remain the arsenal of democracy. Now that's not an idea we talk about very much anymore. 71 years ago, when Franklin Roosevelt first offered that phrase, our company was delivering what would amount to more than 9,900 P-38 Lightning aircraft. This is the airplane that the Germans went on to call the fork-tailed devil. Since then, with the help of 
many industry partners and suppliers, we've designed and developed and produced a breathtaking array of advanced, sophisticated aeronautical systems devoted to our nation's security, aircraft and capabilities that define their generation, like the first U.S. operational jet fighter, the P-80 Shooting Star, the high-altitude F-104 supersonic interceptor, the advanced technology of the U-2 and the SR-71 Blackbird, the multi-role combat capability of the F-16 Fighting Falcon, the stealthy attack of the F-117, the air dominance of the F-22 Raptor, and the world's only fifth-generation supersonic stealthy combat aircraft that can also hover and take off and land in virtually any environment the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Lord knows these innovations did not come easy without their share of risk and difficulty, setbacks and recovery. For that is the true nature and the very essence of invention and discovery and advancement. But throughout history, we have persevered together in the face of adversity to do great things that have resulted in the strongest military on Earth. Over these 71 years, our industry certainly has changed. We're more technologically sophisticated, more specialized in many ways. We're smaller and leaner and more focused than we've been, but also, as a consequence, much less resilient today to shocks and volatility. The global security environment has also changed. The complexity and breadth of today's challenges would have been hard to imagine even a generation ago. It seems there is a certain persistence to some threats. Sea piracy has been around a long time. The first reported incidents of sea piracy were in the 14th century BC, and we're still confronting sea pirates today. Nation states still find themselves at odds with respect to values and aspirations. Witness Iran and North Korea, and perhaps some others. It's very apparent that there are evolving and emerging challenges as well like global terrorism and cybersecurity, and there is no dispute that the velocity of world events is only accelerating with consequences that are both difficult to predict and potentially severe. What has not changed is that our country remains an essential force for good in this uncertain world. We remain a vital security cooperation partner with interests around the globe. And as our fellow citizens forward deploy to protect those interests, our industry believes firmly that we have a moral obligation to protect them as they move into harm's way, that we must remain strong and focused and well prepared for any eventuality, and history instructs that there will be unforeseen eventualities. And finally, we have a workforce that is second to none. Today, our industry supports over one million direct jobs, generating $84 billion in wages, and more than three and a half million jobs in total employment. And these aren't just any jobs. Our employees represent the best of our highly skilled workforce. As America seeks to reconstitute domestic manufacturing after the loss of so many jobs, I encourage you to visit our factories, visit those throughout our supply chain, where you will see a measure of excellence and global leadership. Our workers throughout all disciplines continue to exemplify the highest standards of professionalism, pushing the boundaries of superior performance and defining the state of the art. And each shares a deep and abiding commitment to ethics and integrity in business conduct. Beyond their skills and technological qualifications on the job, our employees are outstanding citizens. Many are distinguished veterans of military and government service. They give generously to philanthropic initiatives contributing tens and tens of millions of dollars each year to charities and millions of volunteer hours to projects of vital interest to the communities in which we live and work. We honor their work ethic, their dedication, and their many contributions. In the coming months, the Congress will undertake a number of critical decisions that will affect our aerospace and defense industrial base, the capabilities that we'll be able to carry into the future, and will establish whether we will remain global leaders for the next century. Let me highlight a few issues around which we have very strong convictions. The Department of Defense is already on a path to reduce the spending by $487 billion over the next 10 years. 
consistent with the requirements of the Budget Control Act. $47 billion of that reduction will occur in fiscal 2013. The effect of this reduction is now being felt throughout industry, and industry is responding to these changes by reducing overhead expenses, constraining capital and reducing research and development, consolidating facilities, and engaging in painful but necessary reductions in force. As difficult as these actions are for us and the people who look to us for leadership, we understand the need to address our nation's fiscal challenges with debt levels exceeding $15 trillion and trillion dollar deficits, and we intend to do our part, and we will. However, the prospect of additional severe reductions in January of 2013 under sequestration is for us another matter entirely. The reduction of another $492 billion with an additional $53 billion impacting 2013 constitutes a challenge for which we have no good response. In this, I believe we're in good company. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta has spoken in the strongest possible terms against sequestration, which he described as having catastrophic consequences to our nation's defense. We support this view completely. The sequestration process has occurred independent of any correlation with strategy, force structure, technology needs, or operational reality. While the precise detailing of the adverse impacts of sequestration are yet to be determined, the United States would likely have the smallest ground force since 1940, the fewest number of ships since 1915, and the smallest air force in our history. The impact on industry would be devastating. With a significant disruption of ongoing programs and initiatives, facility closures, and substantial additional personnel reductions, that would severely impact advanced manufacturing operations, erode engineering expertise, and accelerate the loss of skills and knowledge directly undermining a key provision of our new national security strategy, which is to preserve the industrial base, not dismantle it. Our petition to you today on sequestration is very clear. We ask that we not let an automatic budget trigger, a default position, become the dominant force for allocating resources that will shape our nation's security posture and our industry, and we strongly urge action to stop this process. In the same breath, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the Congress for passing a four-year FAA reauthorization bill. This multi-year authorization provides stability to allow the next generation air transportation system, or next gen, to thrive and allows the FAA and the aviation community to plan effectively. We are certain that NextGen offers significant improvements in safety and efficiency of the air traffic system and encourage sustained investment in this essential capability that will offer superior returns. As we face budget challenges at home, we see a natural intersection between protecting and preserving the industrial base and advancing security co cooperation partnerships with friends and allies. Defense trade with allies and partners enables the United States to strengthen international relationships, project power, and increase interoperability so that the United States is not required to carry the global security burden on our own. Defense trade supports high quality U.S. engineering and manufacturing jobs and keeps the United States on the cutting edge of research and development. We believe the existing export control system which has remained largely unchanged since the Cold War, inhibits the ability of the United States aerospace companies to compete effectively in the international marketplace and support our government's strategic objectives. The administration has become an ambitious effort uh, to re uh, reform the export control system, and we uh, support that effort completely. Further, we understand that Congress will have the chance to become involved in the process shortly as the Departments of State and Commerce work to modify the existing technology control lists. To assist in making U.S. industry more competitive abroad, strengthen the defense industrial base, and promote growth and create jobs here in the United States, we encourage support for export control reform and defense trade initiatives, as well as efforts to reauthorize the Exim Bank where action here is underway today. And I'll refer you to Senator Murray's comments about Senator Cantwell's initiative. This is a most worthy initiative that deserves our support. 
With all modesty, we treasure our industry as a crown jewel. There is no other one like it on earth. Friends and enemies alike envy our capabilities and work ceaselessly to replicate what we together have so carefully built. They recognize that the technology that we develop and produce in the extraordinarily capable hands of our customers has led to a level of preeminence and prosperity that the world has not seen before. Generation after generation of Americans have recognized this value and done all that was necessary to protect and advance our strength. When our industry is at our best, we are working together with our customers and the Congress to meet our nation's greatest challenges, victory in war, prosperity and peace, exploring our universe, providing effective government services for our citizens. This requires a highly collaborative, supportive, and predictable environment that extends over decades, where true innovation occurs, where insight is developed, where knowledge is gained. We together envision a future that others haven't seen, and we wrestle with all the challenges and problems attendant to creating things that did not exist before while working daily under the bright light of public scrutiny. This is as it should be, and the United States has done this better than any other nation. And it was done through a sustained partnership between government and industry, and we need to invest ourselves in these valued partnerships. While our industry today is strong, it's also fragile. In the shadow of sequestration, it can be strengthened and bolstered and continue to assure our dominance for decades to come, or it can be broken. Now is our time to do all that we can. I thank you for your kind attention. Bob, we want to thank you very much for that. Uh, I know Bob has said that he would be happy to take a question or two if there are some pressing from the audience here. I'll give you all a minute here because we've got a couple of minutes before our normal wrap up. Right over here. What does local industry have to do to get through the summer and fit no solution? Let me repeat the question. Both, both the senators, and I, I agree with your, the context of your question, both senators have said industry really can't wait until a lame duck section, session, and, and that is certainly true. And I will tell you, it's true in our company, and it's true in all the companies with whom we operate. We, we have to keep in mind a number of considerations and responsibilities that we have. I tell you, first and foremost, the very prospect of sequestration is already having a chilling effect on the industry. We're not going to hire. We're not going to make speculative investments. We're not going to lean forward. We're not going to invest in incremental training because the uncertainty associated with $53 billion more of reductions in the first uh, uh, fiscal, our first fiscal quarter next year is, is a huge disruption to our businesses. Secondly, in every business, we have responsibilities to our employees. I think both morally as well as legally. And one of the legal responsibilities is to petition under the WARN Act some indication of when we're going to have significant layoffs by geographical area. And these are responsibilities under the law where you have to give something like 60 to 90 days notice to employees. How do we start positioning our businesses in different locales to be able to advise our employees of the consequences of sequestration? These are not easy problems for businesses to wrestle with. Again, I'll refer you to where our business uh, not just our company, but our industry, is at our strongest is when we have a, a transparent but predictable path forward where we can take the most appropriate actions to drive real value. And I think you heard both senators say today, we really have to get incremental value out of every very scarce dollar of defense investment. Well, the best way to do that is to add predictability, and the actions that we're taking around sequestration has just the opposite effect. It's inducing an incredible amount, unprecedented amount, of uncertainty in industry, making planning and execution much more difficult. Tony? Well, can you play that play out? You're going to have to speak up. Play out his question out a little bit. 
more clearly for Lockheed, when would you have to start issuing 60, 90 day notices if there's no, if it looks like sequestration will be decided in a lame duck session? It's well, the, the facts here, the question is when would we have to take specific actions? You, you've got your finger exactly on the pulse of the dilemma for everybody in industry. What specific action? What programs will be modified? What lines of business will be impacted? What sites will be disrupted? I can't remotely predict the consequence of a bow wave of $53 billion that's about to impact industry. We've had to confront the $47 billion in reductions with the Budget Control Act, and we are. And I would submit to you respectfully across the industry, all our colleagues are too. They're taking responsible and necessary and very difficult actions to assure that we're tightening our belts, we're fo focusing on affordability, we're focusing on value for money. To continue to wait and then ask industry to instantly respond to a massive reduction in the availability of funding when we're in already in our year of execution uh, is a massively complicated and unpredictable uh, a approach for any business. And we don't have really rational and really good responses. I will tell you this, all of our companies have thousands and thousands of contracts that have terms and conditions in them that are reinforced by the funding that's available. And when that funding stops, we will be abrogating all those contracts and there will be thousands of claims for equitable adjustments from small businesses that I don't believe anybody has included in any calculus about the magnitude of the disruption that's associated with sequestration. So even the very artfulness of how we would implement sequestration, how we would abide by the law, the Warren Act, and other provisions that we're responsible to abide by, how we would tailor and shrink and shape our company, and how we would respond to suppliers who have an interest in, in whether the contracts will be ongoing, all of that is yet to be determined. So yes? do you predict uh, you know, resulting um, lawsuits or you know, uh, you know, resulting from contracts that might be canceled because of the situation? The, the, the question, I'll try to paraphrase it, but tell me if I get it right, are we anticipating lawsuits? Well, I wouldn't say we're anticipating lawsuits, but the architecture of our business, the, the majority of the work that we undertake in Lockheed Martin is undertaken with our partners and suppliers. We have contracts that define the roles and responsibilities, the expectations and accountability for all that work. All that work in all those contracts that has been let, have been let in, in, a, in some cases in a multi-year way on the expectation that there would not be a $53 billion reduction in January if there's no funding, I can envision a circumstance where many across the industry, not just our company, are forced to stop working. And when I stop working, I'll have to direct our subcontractors and suppliers and partners to stop working, and they will have to do that with theirs. None of that business disruption has been estimated in the cost of products, in the schedule of their availability. The national security strategy has not been built on this uh, inability to have funding. It will be a massive disruption for which I believe there will flow a substantial number of requests for equitable adjustment as people try to reset the baseline. Even, even addressing in, in the case of many highly valued small businesses, whether they will even have a small business anymore. This is a serious matter that we should not wait to address until the lame duck session or January of 2013. Got one final one and then we'll wrap it up. was we'd rather have the White House and OMB and the Pentagon make plans for sequestration. Perhaps I wasn't clear. <laughs> I think sequestration is a terrible idea. As I try to understand it, and I'm, I'm standing humbled in front of people who, who work on crafting legislation as a profession and I admire you. It is not my forte or my strength. But when I look into how sequestration was developed, I don't see that as the epitome of public policy. I, I think it's a default position that we've backed into 
by stepping backwards as the worst case scenario because we have not been able as a nation to come to terms with at least the three elements that are necessary to address a $15 trillion debt and trillion dollar deficits. I personally believe there certainly is a role for cutting expenses, both in discretionary and, and defense accounts and, and non-defense discretionary accounts. I, th I think there's an equal measure of attention that ought to go into examining tax policy. And I think there's another measure of examination that ought to go into entitlement programs. And I think if, if we focus on all three of those things in an integrated and dedicated way, this nation absolutely has the capacity to reduce the overall debt, reduce the amount of deficit, while maintaining vitality because the real answer to our economic challenges is growth in the economy. And that's what I'd like to see us focusing on. What we're talking about now is sequestration and another half a trillion dollars out of defense. I'll remind you there is a similar half a trillion dollars out of other government spending non-defense, but we haven't talked about entitlements and we have not talked about tax policy, which I believe would frame part of an integrated approach to how we can improve the nation's economic posture. And I think it would be a terrible tragedy to break an industry and under-provision our defense department and those women and men who serve in uniform and fail to address the real challenges in $15 trillion of, of total debt and deficits. I, I, I'll say uh, thank you very much. You've been very kind in listening to my remarks. I'm very proud to be a member of this industry. We do terrific work in the interests of this nation, and we will do all that we can to be responsible citizens and address these challenges we're talking about today. Thank you. Bob, we want to be very thankful to you for the kind of detailed and eloquent uh, description of what's in front of us, the challenges we have. I also would refer you all that Tom Captain from Deloitte is here. If you'd like some of the economic analysis that's been cited today in detail, we'd be happy to talk with you. Again, thank you all for coming.